everyone. Thank you for coming. Superstorm Sandy, formerly known as the Frankenstorm or Hurricane Sandy, slammed into the eastern coast of the United States, affecting 23 states from Florida to Maine. And the numbers are startling. Um, approximately 125 deaths in the United States, 100,000 people displaced, and just in New York State, over 300,000 homes were destroyed. Uh, preliminary estimates um, assess the damage at nearly $75 billion, uh, which would make it the second costliest Atlantic hurricane in the U.S. history. Um, the response efforts were, to use the naval term, sorry, sort of an all-hands-on-deck um, situation. So federal agencies, state agencies, charitable organizations, private companies, and our military. Um, our guests today will give us a glimpse of that extraordinary response through the lens of the New York National Guard. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Fucchino has a total of 35 years in the military, first as an enlisted uh, pararescue specialist and then as an officer with uh, qualifications in intel, communications, medical service, and logistics. During his long career, he has served as an Antarctic operations officer, which I have to say, we were talking about earlier and is really interesting, and we should have him back to talk about that. Um, Chief, uh, Chief of Plans for New York Military Forces, Responses to Civilian Authority. You guys need longer titles. Deputy Director for Domestic Response to Civilian Authority, and he's currently the Director of Military Responses to Civilian Authority, which is only one word different, so it's probably a different job. Anyway, he holds three master's degrees in public administration, international studies, and strategic studies, but he also holds a PhD from Columbia, which he was shy about expressing earlier. So. Um, please join me in welcoming uh, Colonel Fakinos. Thank you, Kelly. Can you hear me? Is this a microphone? Okay. Um, I'm here to talk to you about uh, Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, Frankenstorm Sandy, uh, from a guard perspective and from a New York guard perspective. Um, and that's that's the position uh, I'm going to take. Uh, all hands on deck is a great uh, term. We use it too on an airplane. And when we visit with our uh, Coast Guard brethren or Navy brethren, we only visit on slider days. And if you don't know what that is, you can Google it. Okay, here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about what you as a citizens of New York uh, should expect from uh, response and what from, from the Guard. Uh, in general, and this is this is nationwide, 54 states and territories. You should expect the same thing. In New York, um, we have some nuances that are different from other states, but in general, everything's about the same. I'm going to explain a little bit about uh, the tremendous amount of effort we actually put into uh, planning for a disaster and a storm. Um, every state's different, so I, uh, this is from a New York's perspective. And we'll go through how what happened as this storm was coming, we'll build it up. You, you all know the headlines, you all saw what happened on television, you were pretty secure here in um, uh, Syracuse, New York. Uh, it, it's wonderful. I think, have you reached your hundred and some odd inches yet this year? No? You're, you're touted for a hundred and some odd inches a year. Uh, as of snow, so like what's the nor'easters that's happening off the coast right now in which the state has activated the emergency operations center for, I think five inches, you, you guys probably do before breakfast and it's, it's just another snowstorm. <clears throat> then we're gonna, after that I'm gonna talk about the mobilization of the, of the guard and what we, we did, the timeline, uh, to give you a little flavor of um, what occurred and what are some of our mission sets were. And uh, I'm gonna end uh, the, this portion of a concept that's relatively new, it's only a couple years old. It's called the dual status commander. And the dual status commander is, is uh, come out of the Katrina. Uh, it's, and uh, we'll go through that in a little bit more detail, okay? With that, here's what you can expect from the guard. These are the mission sets that are I'm told that we're going to use the modern pointer. <laughs> These 10 are the mission sets that we are uh, directed to uh, have in every state. So all 54 states and territories will have 
the capability for doing all of those 10 uh, mission sets. Command and control is what we do on a daily basis, so we're very good at that. Um, there's a camera, so should I be standing in one place? I can move around. It'll follow you. Move around. It'll follow me? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is modern technology. We should get really crazy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm antsy. I have, a, I have difficulty standing still. Um, we, we do these 10 mission sets. New York State says, these are the mission sets that we want, we, we want you to uh, ensure that you have. And they correlate pretty well to our 10 mission sets. Okay, and, and we're able to do that. We have about, we have about 16,000 um, airmen and soldiers in the, in the guard, 10,000 soldiers and 6,000 airmen. We have the second largest air force uh, in the guard. And we have about 4,000 militia, which is another category that, that's not active uh, duty uh, type. They're, they're volunteers. They're the volunteer militia of the old uh, when our country first started. So these are our mission sets. These are the things that we can do. And we, ha we can bring mass to a situation. And that's the critical part. We are there to support the local community. When they become overwhelmed, a county calls a state. The state then puts its resources against it. And when they become overwhelmed, they call the guard. And the guard puts its resources against it. And when we come, we can come into thousands. And that can do a lot of work. So that's, that's why the guard is there. Also, psychologically, they say that when we come in uniform, it has a, a psychological effect on the population where, where it, it gives them a feeling that uh, uh, it'll be better. Um, at least that's what we're told. Or we tell ourselves that. So what, I don't know which is the truth. OK. In a year, give, any given year, this is what we do. Okay. And this only happened since 9-11. Before 9-11, we didn't do these kind of things. It was all ad hoc. It was like everybody coming into a basketball game and never playing before. But since 9-11, we've got very serious about responding to emergencies um, in, the, in New York State, at least. Okay, This is our yearly calendar that, that I have at least one full-time employee concentrating on this all the time. Okay, and, and that's, a lot, that's a lot of resources. They have the ability to draw from any expert in, in the Guard, in NORTHCOM, at the Guard Bureau, in Washington, D.C., at the state. So they have full flexibility, and we have, we have a plan, and if you take it by weight, it's a several pounds of paper directing what we're going to be doing. But it starts at the end of a hurricane season in November. We take any lessons that we learned, from a hurricane that may have occurred, and unfortunately we had three in the last three years, Earl, three years ago, that missed us, but it gave us some lessons learned. Uh, Irene Lee, last year, that was uh, pretty devastating to the North Country and, and to the South Basin, and uh, we learned a lot of lessons from that, which really got us truly prepared for Sandy. Now, Sandy is not considered a catastrophic event. It was a bad event, not catastrophic. So we took those lessons learned and we created new plans to, to respond um, better. One of the things that we learned was we, we thought 500 people on Long Island would be able to help. Um, we learned during Irene Lee uh, that 500 people can't do very much. It, the mass needs to be in the thousands. So we changed it to 2,500. That we found in a, a, an event like um, Sandy, may not, still isn't enough. So next year, it's going to be even more if something happens. So we take that, we re rewrite our plans, we replay the scenarios, we do a lot of tabletops. Uh, it's very expensive stuff when it comes to people manpower. And this is not everybody's primary job. This is their additional duty that they're doing. They take this and they use it, and by, by April, we think that we've got the best plan we can for this period of time. And now we have to inform the 16,000 people what their responsibilities are. 
So we start publishing uh, con plans and revisions and doing smaller tabletops so they know all what their portion of the big picture is. And that's what we're doing between November and May. Then in May, once we've solidified it internally, we go to the counties, Nassau, Suffolk, the boroughs of New York City, uh, Westchester, and, and those counties, and we meet with each of the county executives and their emergency manager. We tell them what our plan is. We make sure, and we ask them, what is your gap analysis? What are your shortfalls? So we can fill it. Well, the first year we did it three years ago, um, there was zero gap analysis. Everybody said they're good, they're fine. New York City said, I, I am, I am, I've got 350,000 employees. It's not a problem. We can take care of anything that hits us. Um, last year we went to them and they said, well, uh, Irene and Lee showed us that our plans aren't, may not be able to uh, handle what we need to do. I need this capability. Uh, from you guys. I need high water vehicles to help rescue folks in the event something happens. And if they didn't tell us that, we wouldn't have had high water vehicles pre-positioned in New York City and on the island to help them rescue the folks. So that's in a very important meeting that occurs uh, on a yearly basis now. We take that, we do the visits, we publish the plans, and now what we do between June and August is we have thousands of vehicles and pieces of equipment in our inventory. We have to position them within the state appropriately so they can respond within a timely fashion. So between June and August is our heaviest training months. And everybody goes to Fort Drum for training in the Army. It, I, I think they must have a golf course and all kinds of things up there. I've, I'm in the Air Force. I've never been there. I don't, I don't know what's up there. but. Uh, any of you been in Fort Drum? Yeah. yeah? Big attraction kind of thing? or? Uh, I mean, no, no golf courses. No golf courses. Oh, see, that that's why the Air Force doesn't go there. <laughs> but. We only have like a month of summer anyway. So. Yeah. Well, during that month of summer, the Army's up there training, and all the equipment's up there. But once they're done training, we have to move it back to um, be able to respond down to the city, down to the island, Staten Island. Uh, up in Poughkeepsie is where we move everything. Now, we take, we take that and 1 August is what we consider the official start of hurricane season for the Northeast. So from 1 August to 1 November, we issue what is called a warning order. A warning order just puts people on notice that here is your responsibility if we tell you to execute it. And we just remind them and we outline their responsibilities. So that's called phase zero or shaping in the military, in a military decision-making process. Military has defined everything for you. But many of their processes are very good. And the, and the planning process, they're experts at, especially the Army. They're very good at it. So one August comes, we're, we're sitting pretty, and, um, and then all of a sudden, um, Summer's over, everybody's having a good time. But during that period of time, I have an emergency operations center for the military. And, we, and in that, there's 13 people that full, that full time uh, are there track, tracking things that are going on in the world. Uh, one of the things that I have them do is any storm that comes off the African coast, they, they do what we call battle track. And they track that storm, and uh, every six hours, they have to tell me how far it is from New York, when does it hit the window in which it could hit us, and what do we have to do, and, and all that stuff. So it's a practice. Well, we, lately, we've been getting a lot of practice um, with the number of storms out there, and, and it, keeps them, it, it keeps them fresh. So in this case, we do that quite a bit, and it helps us out when it comes down to this coastal storm. Okay. We also do planning, most likely and most dangerous. We, I have a meteorologist on staff, which is a wealth of knowledge and capability. And uh, one of the things we do is, what is the most dangerous um, storm to hit New York City? Other than an earthquake, this is just for a hurricane. They, 
between New York City, New York State's meteorologists, they have determined that the most dangerous uh, hurricane is a category three that hits that area right there, the Bite of New York, and it, and it occurs during the weekday, and um, it occurs at lunar high tide. I'm learning so much about this weather stuff, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> And during Hurricane Sandy, I, I learned more about fuel than I ever wanted to know about. But that was their most dangerous, okay? And what I'm gonna do is, is show you the tracking pattern. And with that tracking pattern, there's a blue line. You see the blue line on that graph? That is the most dangerous path of a storm from New York's perspective, okay? Now, the center of gravity from New York is one place. New York City, okay? So keep that in mind when we look at um, most uh, dangerous. So that's the path, and these are the, the models that showed us that it could possibly uh, hit New York, New York State. At this point in time, uh, we're far more than uh, concerned about this storm coming up the coast. And um, especially where the meteorologist says that this never can happen. That question mark, it's going against the rotation of the Earth. Now, you guys in, that are in weather may know a lot more than I do, but when somebody tells me that, ah, we don't plan for these kind of things because it doesn't happen unless this, 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 this. So there is a probability for it to happen. It did happen in this case here. Um, but these are the tracks, and, it, and it's very concerning to the Northeast, especially to the federal government, because the federal government has a huge population of concern in the, in the Northeast Corridor, okay? As it got closer, that's the path that we're worried about, and that's where the projection was. Those are projections, so that means that it could deviate, and that means it can hit our worst case scenario. We didn't think that the tunnels would flood and the subway would flood until about a category two. This storm taught us something that, um, that we didn't realize. Okay, that's the actual path of the storm. That's our most uh, dangerous situation. And the blue line is our worst case scenario. We were 150 miles off of our worst case scenario in the New York City. Now, it was a bad storm. There was a lot of damage. We escaped a really bad storm in this case. We got lucky. Some people didn't. A lot of people um, got a lot of damage. They lost a lot of things, it, it's, and they're still suffering uh, down there. So though it was bad, it could have been worse. Okay? Here's a timeline that we went through. We started somewhere around uh, October 25th, about four or five days before the storm. Four or five days before the storm, we really started to energize um, things. We started getting a lot of telephone calls. Uh, we started p telling people to get their equipment ready uh, and start packing your bags, okay? We do it often, and then we shut down usually in a day or two. Um, that's just the way the drills go. But in this case, we kept going. It did not deviate from the projections of a weather person, which is, um, I think, a, you know, that's, that's, that's the best job in the world, right? You only have to be like 50% right. That is the best job in the world. So it came through. This is the timeline. Uh, I can leave the slides with you if you want to see in more detail. And we'll go through some of the major points of this. But the important thing is we, we spent 110 days responding after Hurricane Sandy on mission. And um, there's still, the recovery will, will occur for years to come with um, Hurricane Sandy because it, it's just, the, a lot of parts of the barrier islands are just devastated. Okay, the calendar up on the top shows you the red is when it hit uh, land, and the days before are when activities occur. The 22nd is the day we started tracking this storm, and we started drilling with this storm. Just like any other storm, we started drilling, and it takes a, the drill takes about 60 seconds at this point in time. It says, yeah, it could hit us in 15 days or whatever it is. Um, so they started drilling. 
But on the 23rd, our meteorologist said, I'm getting a little excited about this. We call, his name is um, Pino, Sean Pino. He's a master sergeant in the, in the Air Force, and he's our meteorologist, and we call it the Pino Factor. The Pino Factor is either zero for no worries, five for um, really worried. Uh, and this guy gets so excited when these massive storms comes up. He just, just gets so excited. The nor'easters that are, he's not worried about the one that's building right now off the coast. He's worried about the something's coming Tuesday or Wednesday. He said that's, that's a penal factor three. So he started to get worried about this one. He said that the, 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 the stars are aligning and the, and the horoscopes are aligning and this thing's doing things that it shouldn't be doing and it's gonna be bad. So we, we started to really talk to everybody and just give them warnings, okay? About the, uh, the 24th, which is uh, five days before the event, we called all of our organizations in New York State and said, hey guys, um, fuel your trucks, get your MREs packed, which is the meals ready to eat, pack, really pack your bags and start recalling your folks to tell them in two days they're coming into the armories and the, and the air bases to respond to this thing. Uh, if not, we'll shut the whole thing down and it's, it's, it's all over. The Joint Forces Headquarters went uh, on alert on the 25th. That means we started building our staff, doing our projections, doing our um, uh, what is called um, uh, convoy requests through New York State, figuring out where we're gonna put everybody, how we're gonna feed everybody, and doing various things to get everything ready. On the 26th, which is three days before, New York State OEM started to ramp up its operation and we put an LNO there to begin discussing things and helping them with the capabilities of New York, okay? At the same time, about the 26th, New York City is starting uh, to go on to the, um, to broadcast information to the population. Um, remember, it's still three days away, it can veer away. You don't want to stop commerce. Commerce is very important. You don't want to scare the population, but you want to let them know that you're watching. So the city did that. Um, the city um, started to put a timeline uh, in various things to occur. A pre-disaster declaration was declared. Very important. That makes money flow and it allows the state to do things and get a 75% reimbursement, and usually during the first period of an emergency, it's 100% reimbursement for many things. So the pre-landfall declaration was very important for the governor to begin mobilizing a lot of things. One thing in our plans, we have 3,000 folks that are in the city in uniform that are traditional guardsmen, and they use public transportation to get around, to get to the armories. In our plan, it says, move from your home to the armory um, at a certain point in time. Uh, and, you know, being an upstate person, we think, oh, just pop in your car and drive over there. It's a piece of cake. Well, for them, they're starting to shut down public transportation. How do we get our folks to the armory? We're, we're working on that now for next year, next plan, but that was a big... Um, thing for us when they shut down transportation. They shut down the bridges going into the island. They shut everything down. This is a slosh model and they started ish asking people to think about evacuating and then when they, when they said zone A, there's three zones, zone A, zone B, zone, zone C. Zone A has about 300 and some odd people of, 300 some odd thousand people affected by um, tidal surges. And um, 300 some odd folks, that's a semi-manageable number compared to the three million something in zone C, which is even more. And they started getting concerned with zone A because of the lunar tides and, and this and, and, and the surge that now is anticipated to be 13 feet. Our worst case scenario is, is, at, 20, is at 20 feet. Imagine 13 feet of water 
coming in. Water is a very powerful um, substance and can move a tremendous amount of things. It can do a lot of damage. Okay, oh, the storm's almost there. The tag, this is the tag, General Murphy of New York. And when there's an emergency, you will always see the tag right next to the governor, um, as well as many of his other directors, because uh, that is his, his emergency team that can make things happen throughout the state of New York. And the tag will deploy forward with the governor and will be right right there with him. So he, anything the government wants, he can relay it back to the forces, back to us at the headquarters, and we can deploy forces to ensure we got, uh, we fulfill the needs of the state. <clears throat> Day before 27th, we issue an, a formal order. Everybody's coming in. All the logistics are moving. We're pre-positioning troops down on the island the day before landfall with high water vehicles so they can do rescue. Uh, and that was directly from visiting with the various counties from the year before. The, uh, on the 28th, by the 28th, we have 2,700 folks stood up and about 2,000 of them are down in the city. Uh, about 500 of them are in the Westchester County area so they can help because that, that's really the area that has tons of trees. Power's gonna go out. We need to clear the roads. Okay, day of the storm. You, you, you've seen all the pictures on, on, on the things. <coughs> this, is, uh, <coughs> this is JFK. Um, it's a really smart idea to build an airport on a 13-foot elevation area, but it's a flat land. It's right next to the metropolitan area. And water recedes very quickly. So 12 hours after this, uh, the airport was, was open. They just had to check things. Uh, and and um, it was all good. I'm, I'm not sure about the conveyor belts down on the bottom floor. But uh, this is what JFK looked like. The storm surge was horrendous. You've seen the pictures of, of the roller coaster that went into the water. Just devastating. That storm was just like the meteorologist predicted. And, um, you know, that's what the storm looked like. But with it, the storm brought devastation to a lot of shoreline communities. It brought devastation to where the fire department couldn't respond to a house fire, which spread throughout a community. The barrier islands completely went underwater, and I was there the day, uh, day after, and it, it, was, it was heartbreaking. It was terrible to see all that. But the most important thing was that the people were affected. And the people lost a lot of stuff down there. And so our job is to help them come back. And that, that's what the job of the, of the New York Garden domestic operations is, is to help people recover. First, save lives, mitigate suffering, protect property, but most of all, to help in that recovery effort and get, get, you, get everybody back faster. If you have a snowstorm here in Syracuse that dumps 48 inches of snow in which you cannot pass the roads and things. We will bring everything to bear to help clear that snow so emergency vehicles can get through. So you can, you can start getting back to your normal life. So that's our job in the guard, okay? Now, in the military, we love org charts, organizational charts. These little boxes represent 6,000 some odd people uh, that responded to um, uh, this disaster. Okay, uh, an important aspect, I'm gonna use this slide here. An important aspect is, and I'm gonna give you uh, another um, chart later on that's gonna have so many lines you're gonna get confused. But it, and it is confusing. But the hope is, is that there's enough lines in there to, to break down the confusion when you look at it and you eat it one bite at a time. In this case, we had what is called a dual status commander. That dual status commander had the ability to command Title 32 forces and Title 10 forces. Title 10 forces were critical in this uh, operation because the, um, the core of engineers is what we used, had pumps that could pump, it pumped the, um, 
the Brooklyn Tunnel and many of the other tunnels that were completely full of water. Some ungodly amount of uh, water per minute they could pump out. But those tunnels could have been pumped out in 24 hours with their pumps. However, their engineers calculated that they had to pump out only so much water before the, at a time so that the tunnel could do certain things and reassert its structural integrity uh, because if they pumped it out too fast, the tunnels would collapse. So they're good at this stuff. They do it all the time. So they're invaluable. The, the, and they had various other engineers. The, the active duty, the Title X folks have high power electricians. They can take care of high voltage systems. We needed that because tremendous power damage. On the Title 32 side, we had all the other capabilities the medical, the transportation, um, everything else that you saw on that 10 capability slides. And we were organized this way. Aviation, we had an aviation unit that consisted of uh, Army National Guard, Air National Guard, and Coast Guard uh, helicopters. Coast Guard was not assigned to that unit. Coast Guard was attached and cooperative with that unit. Okay. Command and control is very important. Who owns what, who controls what in the military. So this is how we were organized with this. Here's some more, here's some more uh, military charts, pictorial. This is how the units are arrayed before we move them down to the island. We, we brought people from western New York down to New York City. They had to leave 48 hours ahead of time to get there before the storm reached. So there's a bunch of movements, a bunch of planning. On the way over here from Albany, um, I, I watched, because I was at a, a, a meeting at 6, six o'clock this morning with the, with the state EOC on the response to the northeast storm that's going on right now, and they emacked uh, Massachusetts is emacking a bunch of power trucks, emergency management assistance compact. Um, they're emacking a bunch of power trucks, and there were there was a two convoys. There were about 20 power trucks per convoy, moving east, and that was pretty quick because the issued order only came this morning at six o'clock. So I was surprised on how quickly uh, they mobilized the power company. Uh, but this is how we're arrayed, and we moved everybody. The next slide shows on how we were arrayed on the island. We have an air base in Gabreski that works in Suffolk County, and we have a facility in Nassau County, uh, Farmingdale. And those two places, the people bedded down with the storm. They're both rated to handle 150-mile um, winds. They both bedded down there. And when the storm finished, they could pop up and assist with their high-water vehicles and other things. This is what we eventually arrayed our forces down in the city. Floyd Bennett Field is a old Navy PBY base on the, on the corner down there right next to JFK. And that became uh, a saving grace to New York City because we were, that's the only open space other than Central Park that we could house the thousands of people that came in to help the city. And that's where we, we put uh, hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel and staged it to get into the city. This is uh, what New York City folks call upstate, Westchester County. <clears throat> they, were, they had uh, quite a bit of damage too. And we had uh, several um, hundred folks assigned there to help with debris clearance, um, evacuations of patients, and various other things. Okay. If we look at the timeline of, of what occurred between October and the end of December, this is how forces flowed. And we had three types of forces. We had New York State military forces, which is in the green. We had EMAC forces from other states, which are in the blue. And we had, um, in the purple, on the very top, we had Title X forces that came in through the defense coordinating officer on a mission assignment um, for a particular job. But at the peak, we had 5,000, about 5,000 some odd folks um, helping the citizens of, of New York. Okay. 
Our EMAC forces were very important. We, we ran out of certain capabilities very quickly, uh, especially during a, what we call a long, we're a long duration. This, we're okay for first seven days, but anything more than seven days, you get very tired when you respond and you need rest because you're working very long days. And usually you're not in the Hilton or the Marriott like the Air Force is used to. So you're intense and you're eating MREs and, it, and it's, it's very grueling. So we look for replacements on seven to 14 days to come in. And various states uh, did bring replacements. Um, the most important thing was the fuel. That became critical to the whole operation is fuel. And, and some of these states um, had commercial retail in the military, we don't have retail. You know, we have uh, distribution systems, and our retail doesn't fit in civilian vehicles. So our military equipment doesn't work. We have to get conversion kits and a bunch of other things. But some of the guard units are now, uh, ha that have gone through this before, have that ability to fuel civilian vehicles. We brought them in. We brought them in because um, they had the assets, they were ready to use it, we didn't, and through EMAC, we could get them within 24 hours, so they came in. These are all the states that participated and brought in about 500, 700 folks from various states. They stayed about seven to 14 days. Uh, and our capability to draw on them is, is extraordinary, is 100,000 air and 300,000 army is available for us to bring into New York State if we need it. You always got to figure out the logistics on how to feed water, take care of their waste and all that kind of stuff. So that's always a concern. <clears throat> that's our mission tasking. The 10 requested mission sets from the governor, these are the 10. These are the missions that we've, we were tasked to do and these are how many people we put against it. Now we have to do a lot of tracking because FEMA will not reimburse you unless you can associate um, an individual or an activity to a zip code in a county. So we have to track to that detail. So we know every mission that went on in every county that, um, and how much money we spent in that county so that we, so the state can get reimbursed. And we're going through the audit right now. Very painful, very painful. <clears throat> because uh, audits are difficult but the audits go on for years, and it's good. It's a good thing to check and balance system to make sure that um, the U.S. government is reimbursing New York State for those things expended as outlined by the law. So that's a good thing. Okay. Here's some of the statistics. We've, we did 224 missions, major missions. A mission could be uh, wellness checks that I'll go over some of these in the future. Um, but we, we deployed a total of 5,846 people, and we flew 538.8 hours, flight hours. Now, somebody's paying for all this because of Stafford Act. There's a Stafford Act that says somebody's gonna have to pay for this. The Stafford Act requires reimbursement. So all of this stuff, we charge the state, the state collects that bill and, and says, Federal government, I need reimbursement for this, okay? 538 hours, uh, on an average, each hour is billed at a rate of about, depending on what aircraft we used. The cheapest one we used was a, a HH-60, which is 5,000 some odd dollars an hour. The most expensive one we used was a C-5, and the C-5 reimbursement rate was 13,000 some odd an hour. The C-5s were used to fly to California, pick up uh, utility vehicles so they could do power restoration, fly them back. That was, a, that was a hefty price tag, but it got the job done on what they needed to do. Okay, here's some of the accomplishments we did. 738 uh, civilians that um, were counted uh, as rescued, and this was from high water rescue, uh, rescue from buildings and uh, flooded areas, and um, I believe it also includes those that were uh, rescued from uh, nursing homes and things that lost power and started getting flooding, okay? Uh, 
258,000 wellness checks. <clears throat> Not in our mission set, but they, the, 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 the city of New York said, we have to be able to check on everyone. Now, this is November, it's getting cold, there's no power, and people aren't leaving their houses. How do you knock on every single door to see if they needed something or if they needed evacuation? Or some of them had no telephone, telephone, nobody, no relatives around. They were too old. They can't even walk up and down the stairs. They were housebound completely. They said, well, the only people that could do that with masks was the military. So we, we took the mission and we knocked on 258,000 doors over several weeks. And that's the numbers that associated with some people. I mean, literally, there was one story in which they came into the house. That person was dehydrated. Um, they haven't, hadn't eaten. They couldn't. They were uh, hallucinating. They were on their chair. They couldn't move. They were an elderly individual. And it, it was, and they called 911. They got them, and no one. Um, that they found uh, died uh, from that activity, but there were quite a few people that were quite um, not in good conditions when they were found. And politics comes into play, very important. During Thanksgiving, um, 3,000 turkeys were delivered. Not sure how they cooked it, but they were delivered. <laughs> Okay, from the ten mission sets, really quickly, I'm going to go through some of some of the, the some of the things that we did. Um, we have a thing called the civil support team, a rapid response team that does nuclear, biological, and uh, weapons of mass destruction detection, uh, and they have equipment that will make your head spin. Um, they are tremendous capability. One tr one communication truck ran. Uh, an, entire, an entire city council activity in the Nassau County area. They, ha they set up microwave links and they did other things. Um, they did all kinds of digit, they, they, they're all geeks. I don't know if that's a correct word to use, but they're very smart, they're good at what they do, and they have the equipment to do it, so uh, we applied them to what they did. We have these kinds of equipment that um, this, this is what we had lined up, ready to assist. 110 satellite communication vehicles to provide um, communications to, um, it can provide up to a million people, communications. Uh, so we had that lined up, ready to go. We had an airborne communication platform on an HH-60 that could replace um, cell towers if they went down. We were lucky in this storm. Communications was great. Cell, cell phones worked. It was wonderful. We have uh, this emergency operations center. Uh, we have several of them that are positioned around the state that can be used. That's the third one. And the fourth one um, was a bunch of convoys that, that we work in, and uh, we help the law enforcement with patrols and other things. Okay. Air transportation. The C-5 that went to California, um, that was the last flight of the C-5 for New York State because after that, we transitioned from the C-5 to the C-17, which is a new aircraft, uh, and, uh, and it costs less to operate. This is the, a picture of our tag, uh, General Murphy, with the general that's in charge of all the National Guard, and his name is General Grass and they were doing a flyover to assess what was going on. Um, this helicopter you see there on, on the, in the third picture is, is a helicopter we bought specifically for domestic response. It will never go overseas to war. It is purely here to stay and help the governor uh, in the response. It has full motion video and other communication devices, so we can pump the video of what this shows uh, to anywhere in the state we need to pump so they can have um, full visibility and do assessments from not only in the air but on the ground. So our air transportation is important. 
We augment the New York State Police. New York State Police is in charge of air in New York State, other than the FAA, but they are in charge of the airframes. Okay, we did a lot of ground transportation. We moved about a, I think we had somewhere in the city of 1,200 vehicles, Humvees and various things uh, deployed uh, down to New York City and, and the lower Hudson Valley. Search and rescue, we have one of the three pararescue units in the United States under um, guard. These, these folks are highly trained individuals that um, love their job. They get to jump out of perfectly good airplanes once every 90 days. They get to um, ride a, um, an inflatable boat on the back of a CH-47 uh, at 40 miles an hour and then lift off while they're in the water. They get to rappel and they get paid to do this kind of stuff. But uh, they do dangerous things, similar to the Coast Guard um, and the, the rescue swimmer program. Um, it's just that these folks are trained uh, paramedic and emergency room nurses and rescue down pilots for combat. So uh, their purpose is for combat, but they come in very handy and they got all the toys in the world to rescue folks uh, in, in a situation like this. Public works and engineering, we clear debris. Uh, we have heavy equipment that helps come in things. Uh, the, the city of New York asked us to clear debris down on the island. I'll give you an example. Our capability is really tiny compared to commercial. But in the emergency, we can, we can help out that initial phase. And we're able to clear about 500 metric tons a day. The commercial entities that came in after us, they clear somewhere between 100,000 tons a day or more. Uh, they have capability. It's a for-profit activity, so they, they do what they need to do and they bring in all the things. But that's usually after seven days or 10 days after they can let a contract and things. But we're there to do emergency debris clearance immediately after the storm. Logistics, the Army is logistics and they are good at it. They know how to do this and we can move stuff and we can distribute stuff and we know how to track stuff. There was more stuff moving into New York State than you can even ever imagine. You know, I was sitting in the control room and they, they said, we need water. And I said, well, okay. I figured, you know, we go to the store, we buy a case of water. <clears throat> and, and my logistics guy says, yeah, I'm gonna order water. So he calls up and he calls up uh, a water company in western New York and says, what's your capacity? And they said, 22 18-wheel trucks a day. He said, okay, I'll take your next seven. That's stuff. That moves, that moves, that makes, that allows people to survive. One of the things, the very education that, that you brought up to me earlier is education. You know, they, they, they tell us and they, they hopefully they expound, make sure you have three days of food or, or water or those kind of things. Make sure you have this, make sure that. In a disaster, you're not gonna have things back to normal for a long time, but expect no power for three to seven days. Expect not going to the grocery store for three to five days. Okay? You see, when you go through the news, People are buying eggs and milk and all those things that have to be refrigerated. Hopefully they have generators at home because there's not gonna be power. But we are good at logistics. Humanitarian and sheltering. We did a lot of humanitarian things. Um, on the far left-hand side, uh, capability, and we're gonna talk about capability. On the far left-hand side, in three days, we built a city to house 5,000 people uh, and we were ready to build, to expand that to 15,000 if we needed to, uh, and that's capability. Now, if something really bad happened to where they need a whole bunch of shelters and things um, to handle New York City, I don't think anybody has the capability to do that. However, we can get it started. Uh, there's millions of people down there. Okay, those are some of the, some of the accomplish that we, we did. It, it's, 
It goes, runs through the gamut. The important thing is we're here to help you. The, and then what I'm gonna do now is transition to the, the command and control, that uh, dual status commander process. The most important thing I wanna say here is we in uniform in the United States are never in charge. Never. Never is a word that you should never use. We are not in charge. Okay, I'm gonna put some caveats on that. <clears throat> there may be caveats on that, and some of you are law students, maybe, uh, and, and you probably know far more detail about it, but um, we could be in charge under extraordinary and extremely catastrophic circumstances in which absolutely no one else is alive. But we'll find the next, the first civilian person, and if they're anointed as a civilian leader, we will be subordinate to them at all times. Our forefathers made it very clear. They do not want the military running the United States. They do not want a coup, and they don't, they don't, they don't want the uniform to uh, suppress democracy. That's, that's a very important to us, and we in the Guard believe that because most of the time, we are not in this uniform. We're just like you. Students, we work in the, the local stores and we do various things in the community. We are the community. So, most important, we're never in charge. There's always a civilian leader that is in charge over us. We do what they say and we don't tell them what to do, okay? Dual status commander came about um, Katrina. There was uh, a problem with command and control, and in the military it's important for command and control, and there was a problem with unity of effort. Unity of effort means everybody in this class has expertise. And if we can take everybody's expertise and synergize it into a common goal to meet an end objective, we're awesome. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna be an awesome company and we're gonna be an effective uh, corporation to move forward. But if this is the dividing line and everybody on the left works independently and everybody on the right works independently and you guys and we don't get together, our unity of effort is squashed and our capabilities diminish considerably. This program allows Title 10 active duty and Title 32 Guard to work together under a single commander who can tell both what to do. And for those of us in the military, that's very important because we are completely trained to listen to our boss. If we don't listen to our boss and what our boss tells us is legal, is moral, and it are, is ethical, if it meets those criteria and we don't do it, well, our boss can then place what is called the Uniform Code of Military Justice and place us in this bubble and prosecute us for not obeying a command. Simple. Your career's ruined, you go to jail, or whatever the punishment is. So to us, it's, it's sacrosanct, is a command. This allows that one individual to do that. That, I'm gonna show you the next slide of a little a spaghetti diagram, but it's, it's really brought about by the governors. And the governors uh, said, I need a unity of effort, but I must have the integrity of my state. I do not want the federal government to override state jurisdiction. So if you're coming into my state, I want control over you. This dual status commander, <laughs> rides on that spaghetti diagram. <clears throat> this dual status commander works for the governor and works for the president. How many of you like two bosses? That's an interesting situation. It, it, solves the, it, it solves everything below the individual. Everybody down here has only one boss. Everybody boots on the ground has one boss. 
But that one boss has to now decipher. There's a lot of lines going to that one boss. This is the FEMA. FEMA is a bureaucracy in its own. I'm using it in a loving way, bureaucracy. <clears throat> this is um, NORTHCOM and the Department of Defense, which is a little bureaucracy in its own also. And then there's the state entity called the Guard, and then your civilian entity for that state. All those things point to one person, and that's the dual status commander. That dual status commander has to be the person, the arbitrator of conflicting events. And if there is conflicting orders, that person has to go to the source to help deconflict it. But the nice thing is, everybody down here has only one goal. Whatever that person says is what they do. And that, and if this is, in our case in Sandy, it was, it was 5,800 people. Imagine Katrina. Katrina, there were 80,000 folks from the active duty, 50,000 folks from the guard, doing all separate things, doing their, they wouldn't mix, they wouldn't combine assets. If a active duty person, their equipment was sitting in a parking lot and the guard needed it, they couldn't give it to them to accomplish a mission. That, that, that didn't work. And that's why they came up with this. And, and it, it worked really well during Sandy. I mean, there's some nuances that, that occurred, but, since, but we're on television and things. We'll just leave it at that. There's some nuances that came up with uh, some of the things. And, uh, uh, but it does work, and it's a good program. And um, that is actually the transition part for the Title X in NorthCom. So that concludes the guard part of it, too. You, questions? Any questions? We were very lucky on the 26th of December. Um, New York City thanked us for our efforts and uh, um, the tag and, and representatives from the, from the Guard uh, got to ring that, that bell. That's actually a pretty exciting place. <laughs> I don't know how they do the pits every day. I just don't, don't know that. Their blood pressure's gotta be outrageous. But any questions? That concludes the, the, my formal part. But if you have any, any questions, okay. Okay, if you don't have questions, I'm gonna ask you. Go ahead. Uh, with the, the branch of the National Guard that does law enforcement work, what specific law enforcement training or what kind of capacity law enforcement or is the uh, guard troopers going to as compared to the military training that helps them work with the law enforcement? Okay. Um, I'm gonna answer that question in two parts. It is every guardsman's responsibility to augment law enforcement. Okay, so that is, that is a task that can be given to any um, guardsman to, law, to augment law enforcement. However, we do have specialized units that have additional training, non-lethal weapon, uh, training and our MPs and security forces get get semi equivalent training from the civilians. They just uh, they may not have the specific state law enforcement, and in many in most cases and in, in New York's case, they're not deputized. Okay. However, there are instances in which we do have uh, the state police will has a program to deputize us if we need to be for certain situations. When we go to the J Boy Scouts Jamboree in Virginia, they deputize our security forces and military police um, to give them Title 14 powers, basically, which is the arrest capability and more law enforcement. Does, does that answer your question? Or You guys on Title 14 are very different, and you have significant more uh, capability, where we have a basic we have some people trained, but there must be a cognizant um, elevation and additional training in order to get us to a certain point. One of the things 
things, the missing piece I'm, I'm not getting is the uh, the junior guy in the field, and he's told, hey, go out there and help the state police with whatever they need. Uh, boot camp really doesn't do that for the normal army. I'm curious if there's any kind of uh, your drills where you drill with the state police or with the local police and you kind of get the, the the interaction a little bit more so they know how to work with those individuals. Um, the one thing the military instills upon everyone, uh, and especially the younger, the people just coming in, is discipline. We will not deploy a person if they, we have, we question their discipline capability. We will not deploy them, especially in the law enforcement capacity, if we even have an inkling of questioning their capability. Um, and usually if they go on that road, they usually aren't lasting very long in the military. So a, a young 18, 19 year old person of E2, E3, um, with the proper discipline that's provided by the military, we expect them to be assigned anywhere uh, to and adhere to the guidelines given. Is what is that? Okay. So, if if any of you want uh, leadership training, I have a recruiter right outside the door. No, go ahead. In our home history class, you talked a lot about you know, the sharing between federal, state, and local. So in the case of Sandy, um, if people are getting out of line, if civilians are starting to riot, what's the process where you would take over from the local police or the state police? It, how does that work? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna correct a portion of your question because we will never take over, okay? We will never take over. Um, the process is, home rule is within New York State, so that means that we have, anybody is in, has to be invited into the jurisdiction of the local community. So um, I'm gonna give you an example of Hurricane Irene, Prattsville. Prattsville, um, the state EOC got a frantic phone call saying that there's rioting and looting in Prattsville. Anybody you've been, been in Prattsville? There's about 112 people in Pat Prescott. <clears throat> um, there's probably more. I'm being a little sarcastic, but somebody called and said there's rioting in Prattsville. Um, send the guard. Uh, <laughs> we take everything seriously. The uh, EOC then issued us an order to, to um, report to Prattsville, augment the local sheriff armed. They asked us for 250 people. Um, and that, that's, how it, that, that's how it occurred. We will do that. Uh, in this case, um, we couldn't put a stop to it soon enough because we called the sheriff who was sleeping. So we know that's a good sign. <clears throat> and, um, and we finally got and this comes to your um, point. We finally got a 19-year-old female who was the lead of, the, of a water uh, d dispersal unit that we sent to Prattsville because they had absolutely no water. Prattsville was completely destroyed in Irene. And she was, a, she was the lead of a four-person unit, the E4. She was 19. And she had three E3s with her. And we called her up and we said, go find whoever's in charge of Prattsville and find out what's really going on. Well, she, she did. And she went to the, uh, the, the county person and um, the county person said, mm, no, that's not going on. But, but we couldn't, we deployed so fast that unit that we couldn't put a stop to it. Um, and we, when we did the forensics on it, what happened was somebody was firing a gun somewhere in the hills. Um, poaching, uh, they, found, they, they were doing hunting. And somebody called and said they're looting and rioting in the, in the town. So, but we reacted. So you always reinforce the local? We will always reinforce the local. We never take the lead. Never take the lead. If, if chaos occurs in which a local township is um, 
completely devastated to where there's no law enforcement, the state police's jurisdiction is take, take that over and we then report to the state police. But we will never take over. Yeah, I had a question about something you said fairly early on, which is you really ramped up your planning for disaster and emergency response after 9-11. Uh, another thing that happened after 9-11 were two fairly significant wars, which drawn a lot of guard assets, especially personnel. So I'm wondering how you do the emergency planning when you've got personnel going in and out of theater and stuff like that. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a really good question because it, it adds the dynamics to it. The dynamics is um, there was a period of time in which 50% of our resources were deployed. Uh, and that, that was um, in 2007 time period. So one, whenever we do planning, we can only, we can only anticipate 50% of the forces being available. Because some are critical first responders that we can't draw from the community. Uh, so that's first part. Now we say if 50% of 16,000 is available, that means 8,000. But if half of them are deployed, now we only have 4,000 or less. EMAC becomes a very important part of our planning. And we have an EMAC conference once a year. Uh, and we, in fact, one is next week. And that I go to, we, I go to, and 54 states are there. And we negotiate and say, hey, here's my scenario. Here's what I'm going to need. Here's my gap analysis. Who can do it? And during the 2007 time frame, we said, I need everything. If something happens, who can do it? And that's one of the, the things that, that the, the um, governors have made very clear to the Department of Defense. You will not deploy more than 50% of my domestic resources, or I cannot respond to an emergency. Does that answer your question? OK. Any other questions? Can you touch with the involvement with civilian organizations that were on the ground? Because there were reports from the ground from Occupy Sandy, which mm -hmm. was an offspring of Occupy Wall Street that operationalized during the relief efforts that said that the National Army actually dropped supplies to them to distribute. But given what you had said about having to account for every zip code you're working in, I'm trying to understand this information. Yeah, we, um, a lot of NGOs are involved. Uh, church organizations, um, um, a lot of NGOs. The NGOs actually are a very integral part of the recovery effort and have specific responsibilities within um, certain areas. <coughs> Excuse me. And those, those NGOs are um, people we support. We will bring truckloads of things to the NGO so they can, they can distribute to the community. In some cases, we help them distribute to the community if they don't have the resources to do it. Uh, but they've been appointed, usually, uh, as part of the recovery effort by the incident commander. And But if they're not uh, appointed by the incident commander as part of that recovery er effort, the incident commander won't send us to them. Does that get your question? And NGOs? are critical in recovery. They're more, they're more, they, they are as critical as the infrastructure in the city. They are the infrastructure of a city. So, so um, and, and one of the other things that, that we do is rely heavily um, on commercial entities. There is, re I say the Army is logistics, speedy logistics, is FedEx and UPS. They can do it, and they can do it fast. Spe um, quantitative logistics is the fuel um, system within the United States. And the department, or the DLA, uh, Defense Logistics Agency, you know, they have mass. They can move hundreds of thousands of gallons in, in a day. They, they can... Con work with refineries to do whatever they need to do. But um, it's the commercial entities. We used to set up food distribution points in Walmart parking lot or um, Home Depot. We don't do that anymore. We do it in schools and other things because we need them to get open. Because they can, they can, 
they can distribute food to the area and other things. And most of them then start, uh, I won't say giving the food away, but are part of the recovery effort to help distribute the goods. Very important part of the recovery effort. Okay. Any other questions? Well, please join me in thanking uh, Thank you.